This week on CrossFeed. Supreme Court. Government needs to stay out of church decisions. New York Court. Churches need to stay out of schools. Virginia Court. Anglicans need to leave their churches behind. English Court. Leaflets are hate speech. In Czech government, the church is in the mail. Hello, everyone, and welcome to CrossFeed Religious News. I'm Pastor Dale Critchley, Pastor Shepherd of the Ridge Lutheran Church in North Ridgeville, Ohio. I'm Pastor Jim Butler at St. Luke's Lutheran Church in Dedham, Massachusetts. Hey, everybody. Uh, on this night when Dale is in deep mourning, uh, his Packers lost the playoffs today and are out to lost to the Giants, who have a Interesting habit of taking teams that have spectacular season, regular season records and ruining them when it comes to the playoffs. It was miserable. <laughs> well, hey, you know, there, there, there are are risk for now. In life. No, no. New England. Yeah, all I can do is root against the Patriots. <laughs> so, you know. See, well, I'm, I'm wearing my Chiefs jersey, you know, and remember the fact that we beat Green Bay earlier this year. So, you know, so, so we can't we, we remember what we remember. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Um, well, let's go ahead and start with probably the biggest case uh, that we actually talked about a couple months ago when uh, it was argued before the Supreme Court. And that was Hosanna Tabor Evangelical Lutheran Church versus EEOC. Um <clears throat> and uh, case of a woman by the name of Cheryl Pyrick, I believe her, was her name. Uh, and she was what we in the Missouri Senate call a commission minister. She was a teacher. She was originally hired as a um, lay teacher in the school, uh, went through what we call a process called colloquy, and then was commissioned, uh, uh, which uh, took a lot of religion courses basically that she had to do online, uh, had to go through a uh, – Interview at, with uh, faculty, probably Concordia Ann Arbor, uh, became a commission minister. And a couple of years later, uh, de- give or take, developed narcolepsy and needed to take a disability. Church granted that disability leave. Uh, and she came back in February and said, um, 2000, it's February 2005, and said, uh, hey, um, I'm. Uh, feeling better. I'm ready to come back to it. Uh, and they're like, well, we already hired a replacement for the entire year. And you, you know, we don't really have a place for you. And she's like, well, fire the other person and, you know, bring me back. And they're like, well, we can't do that. We hired this person. Um, and we're not sure you're ready. You know, we're, we're a little worried what happens in the classroom if you go in one of the deep sleeps all of a sudden. And she showed up on a, um, uh, on day in February, can't remember what the day was, demanding her job back, and they said go home. And she wanted a letter saying that she's showing that she showed up for work that day. And uh, then she informed them that she was going to sue the school for discrimination because under the American Disabilities Act. And uh, shortly thereafter, she was fired. Uh, or actually released from her call. She was removed from her call and her position by the congregation um, for uh, being disruptive, for threatening a lawsuit, uh, for not going through the synod's prescribed rules. And so the, uh, uh, she sued the church um, in federal court. The church said, we have a ministerial exception, and uh, we want summary judgment. And the court agreed. The Sixth Circuit, however, reversed. They said she's not really a minister. She teaches all these uh, non-religious subjects. Um, um, She spends just a little bit of time each day leading, uh, doing the religion class. She teaches chapel a couple times a year. Um, We don't see she's got enough time in this to be called a minister, and they reinstated the case. And so it went to the Supreme Court. And that was where it lay. Uh, and the court case came down. It was considered the most significant religious, a freedom of, of religion um, 
discussion in 20 years. And by a, yeah, and by a 9-0 ruling, uh, the uh, Supreme Court said, A, there is a ministerial exception in this, which had been the, the, the lower courts had said in the past, but the EEOC said, no, it does not exist at all, period. Um, they were arguing completely against it. And B said, you know, basically she is a minister. By her, um, you know, she had to have extra courses. She had to go through a, a training, a, 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 an, an interview. She received a call. She, um, by by this call, she had privileges that the other teachers, did, lay teachers, did not have. Uh, for example, she could only be removed by a supermajority vote. She had automatic tenure. All the other, if, if you didn't were a, a roster teacher, uh, then you only had a um, one year contract. And that contract could, could be renewed for, for no reason. I mean, you were really an at-will employee. And finally, they said uh, she, she defined herself as a minister. She took the ministerial tax exemption. And uh, in the letter, when she wanted to come back, she kept talking and saying, I feel called. I believe I am called to the teaching ministry. I want to return to the teaching ministry. How can you have a ministry without being a minister? <laughs> uh, and so, um, uh, it was a, it was an amazing case, really. Uh, and probably will, you know, stop a lot of nonsense. Uh, and boy, I, and they slapped down the uh, EEOC's arguments. They just said, you know, you have no right to even go there. Um, you know, we, we find that the arguments very, <laughs> I thought, John Roberts, the writer, was very um, kind. He said, you know, we find them um, untenable, you know, which I think was a nice way of saying we were laughing to ourselves as we were reading this stuff. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, we call that full of it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I, yeah. this is, a, I mean, this is a big deal. And uh, one of the things that's really important about this um, ultimately is – that it's um it allows you know for instance if if the court had ruled in her favor um this would raise questions of uh can a, a church say no uh we're uh releasing this pastor from his call because he rejects Christ's divinity um you know there's there's all these issues of of basically the the court is not qualified uh to make decisions about who a church can and can't have as a minister and and what those right. qualifications are and absolutely um, you know this this goes into um can what happens if uh um a church discriminates against a minister for being a woman, all right? Don't allow women pastors or don't allow gay pastors or don't allow um, a pastor who will perform gay marriages, all right? I mean, this is, this has really wide sweeping um, effects and it's really a, a very strong uh, vote for religious freedom. Right. Um, Michael McConnell writing in the um, um, Wall Street Journal says um, the Obama Justice Department um, asked the court to disavow the ministerial exception altogether. This would mean that in every future case, a court and not the church would decide whether the church's reasons for firing or not hiring a minister were good enough. And this is why the Obama administration should stay out of it. <laughs> yeah. Or any, no, that's not a, a, a sort of partisan comment. This is the fact that this, that actually, it proves the point that right. the government is not qualified to make those decisions. So it's sort of an ironic, um, thing for them to take a stand for. They, they prove themselves wrong. Right. The, um, well, I, I think a very important issue with that is, um, oh gosh, what was I going to say? Oh, that, that, you know, 
you know, and I did object a couple people because some people said, you know, the Obama or Justice Department did this, and the Obama group administration did this. This court, this case started in 2005 mm-hmm. with the EEOC. So it was the EEOC under the Bush administration that began fighting for the whole thing. You know, they're the ones who didn't step down, just look at her when she walked in the door and said, look, you're, you're a minister in a church. We're sorry, but we can't do anything for you. You know, they're here. I mean, they they came out with the final arguments, but the arguments, you know, began with the EEOC under the Bush administration. Um, and you know, it's that's just a key key part of it. So, you know, you know that they should have said in two thousand five, "Lady, there's nothing we can do for you." You know, but then government, by its nature, has to control everything. Um, <laughs> I knew one situation where a pastor was let go for just reason, and. um <clears throat> he um, then sued the congregation, uh, arguing discrimination because um, they were basically German, and he was of English extraction. Hmm. You know, and you know, you know, like you're both an American and you're both white. What are you talking about? <laughs> You know, but I mean, you know, but that would the court would bring that in, you know. I mean, you know, well, I wasn't German enough for them. You know, I didn't know what a Rins verse was, or I wasn't rural enough. You know, I didn't know what a combine was. Mm-hmm. You know, and so they, I think, a lot of areas that you know, you you just you know, um, and I really appreciated the fact uh, that. Uh, um, it, it, they highlighted the fact that the, the purpose of the First Amendment is to protect the church from the state. Mm-hmm. And there's no questions about that. Yeah, yeah, and the, both uh, the free exercise clause and the establishment clause are just sort of the, the two sides of the freedom of religion coin. The, both of these are in favor of of in this case the church and and against the uh the teacher here. So now note that this only applies to ministers, all right? So this, this does not apply to your janitor. All right? I'm assuming that in this case like the, in this case of the school that it would only apply to these commissioned teachers as opposed to the hired teachers. It would, um, and it's very it, and it's very narrow. I mean, that's that's one thing. They're they're, they're like, um, you know, we realize there's some questions here uh, that are going to have to be answered at a future time. But you know, this is you know, but we this this we're confident of saying. So or they really did do it on very narrow grounds, which is the nice thing. It's, it was not overly broad. Um, that's one thing I liked about uh, the Roberts Court. It tries to do things on the narrowest grounds possible. Right. What you know, so that you don't have to, you don't have a decision that's overly broad, and you know is not un, un, unreasoning. Uh, but I'll tell you what was amazing to me. The other thing is now this was a a a, a nine o uh, decision. There were two concur- concurring opinions written, one by Justice Thomas, and then the other one by <laughs> Justice of Alito and Justice Kagan. Now here, you know, their views of jurisprudence in the Constitution are very different from each other. I mean, one was the George Bush appointee, the other was President Obama's appointee. And they both agreed. They both were, they wrote this, 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 this opinion together, and it said uh, basically, the question comes up who's a minister? It's whoever the church says. We're not qualified to make that judgment. Mm-hmm. You know, if the church says this person's a minister, that person's a minister. End and, and, and of story. You know, but I think again we can't be overly broad in that ta- that term. Uh, I do remember um, one church that uh, 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 back in the days of everyone's a minister, and their secretary was called Minister of Office Affairs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I you didn't know what kind of that. affairs they had going on in their office, but <laughs> she was the person who would take care of them for you. <laughs> so, right, and you, you know, arrange the affairs or what? But she was in charge of the affairs. <laughs> And that's that's a blurring of the, you know, you've got on the one hand the doctrine of vocation, which I was talking about my kids with my kids the other day, um, 
because it it emphasizes uh, that well we in in our family this spring we're going to have a graduation, a confirmation, and a baptism all right around the same time, and we're going to invite family to um, since they're coming from a long ways off, we're just going to celebrate them all together. And uh, my daughter who's graduating said, "Gee, mine doesn't seem as important as the other two." And I said. No, it's just, according to the doctrine of vocation, it's just as important. You know, these are these are all very important things, and um, and uh, you know, on so on the one hand, and I, and I said, and actually, the doctrine of vocation uh, is, uh, um, in a sense, one of the reasons that I initially resisted uh, the pastoral ministry because I I thought that I'd be able to uh, connect with more people. Um, who are not Christians uh, through a secular uh, vocation than as a pastor, and um, and and so I really struggled with that for a long time, and um, you know, the, so uh, just because you're not a minister, uh, you know, a, a called pastor or um, or some other sort of uh, professional church worker. Um, doesn't mean that your job is any less important. You know, we still need to eat. And so therefore farmers and other people that work with food uh, are very important to us. Uh, Cause I can, I can preach law and gospel all day long. Um, but if you're all starving to death, <laughs> you're not going to hear me. <laughs> so, um, but, but yeah, you can't, you can't blur that with the office of the ministry. But Dale toasts a, hot, a good bagel, folks. Let me tell you, he 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 has that toaster on right. So, <laughs> uh, but yeah, doctrine of vacation is very important. So that was a great court case this week and a very happy one. Um, on the other hand, there were a couple of them this week that were extremely depressing. Uh, one was in New York. Now, and, and I'm really I, I haven't been able to read too much um, about this one because I I really like to read the. the case because I'm still unsure how they made this decision, but uh, the um, uh, 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 Mayor Bloomberg in New York uh, has not liked churches being able to use public schools for worship services. Um, And there is a state law in New York that says that uh, they do not have to. Um, um, and yeah, okay, in 2001, the Supreme Court ruled that religious organizations must have equal access to public school space for activities like club meetings and religious lessons. But this uh, appeals court, the federal appeals court this week ruled that they could ban worship services because they could imply government endorsement of a particular faith. And uh, roughly 160 congregations in New York, uh, mission churches basically, use public school space for services. And now they will have to stop doing so by February 12th. Go, I say go away, boy. You bother me. So, you know, what we're talking about is, you know, nobody's in the school on Sundays or especially Sunday mornings. Right. And, uh, and so they rent out the gym. You know, they're paying for the use of it, just like any other organization that would rent out the space. And, um, and they rent it out so they can have their service there. Uh, they, uh, you know, they work out the details of who's going to supply the chairs or whatever. Um, and they, they bring in their sound system equipment or whatever. And, and they set up on Sunday morning, they have their service, they, you know, strike the set in a sense. And, um, and they get their stuff out of there. They clean up after themselves and, and they pay their rent. And, um, so, this is just yeah this is confusing to me because they're just renting the space that's i mean that would be like saying that if a uh, um if somebody has a um a wedding reception um at a a bowling alley that the um the manager of that bowl the bowling alley is um, endorsing that couple. No, they're just renting the space. Right. 
Or it would be like saying, um, you know, if um, they rented the um, um, gymnasium, if the Republicans rented a gymnasium to have Mitt Romney come in, that the school is then endorsing Mitt Romney. Right. Or, you know, I mean, no, that, that doesn't say that. It just says that this this group is renting the space. This is a public space. Um, That's all you're doing. You're just simply renting the space. Yeah, what about if they rent out the, um, the public parks pavilion? You know? You know. The, the picnic area. The, the church, what if a, you know... What if our, what if our church wants to rent out our local parks pavilion to have our church picnic at the at the public park? Right. Um, oh, that if you're just having a picnic, that'd be one thing. If you're having a worship service at the pavilion, that might be something. Oh, different. well, okay. Well, then you know, well, we, we we're gonna pray before the meal. <laughs> For that matter, if we're gonna do, I mean, we've we've done that. We've had outdoor worship services, not. I mean, we've got our own pavilion and stuff. We've got our own space here, so that if we were going to have an outdoor service, we'd do it here. But, um, and and you actually our local park, you can't reserve the space. But, um, but when uh, the the church I was at in Wisconsin, my first call, um, we rented out the local park to have uh, once a year a Sunday worship service, and then we have like a carnival afterward. Um, but it was like we had a like a flatbed, uh, you know truck kind of thing that um where and we would have the service at the park right nobody took that as the um the local city government endorsing our church we were right. renting the space i mean you know i think most reasonable people you know i think the people are saying why is that church in there on sunday they paid 500 bucks to rent the space you know, yeah. get oh, over okay. it. You know, the kid's not there. They're not advertising to the kids. They're, you know, they're advertising the community. Yeah. Mean, but even Massachusetts, we don't have a problem with, you know, we have a, we have a mission church up here that uh, has a service in a uh, uh, a gym. They had another church that, uh, I, I, uh, are they in the gym or the, the cafeteria? One or the other, the public school. And actually, about 10 years ago, uh, a Baptist church was started out of the same school. Nobody looked at that and said, "Oh, that church, that school's um, supporting those two churches." You know? I mean, the reality is, there. a lot of mission churches. I've even heard of churches that deliberately avoid buying property because they want to be sort of in the community and 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 they want to be decentralized, um, and so they deliberately avoid having a sort of set space, and and they. I mean, schools are the default place to have it because they've got this nice gymnasium. Right. A lot of times they've got the room, and they're generally not doing anything on Sunday morning. Right. Or some other time. Um, okay. On the other hand, I guess I see things, certain things as helpful in this thing and certain things as not helpful. So I said they had a pray-in, a bunch of people praying. People are writing letters. Uh, people are, you know, doing other things. And then there's one guy, Demas Salaberios pastor of Infinity New York Church, the Bronx. And he's on a hunger strike. He's been consuming only water for nine days and says he would not eat until the city reversed its position. We are hoping that someone will do will research a little further and see that the churches have been doing good works and will be self-destructive to the city to kick them out. Now, come on. That does not help. I mean, I don't, I don't see why people... My personal thing, if somebody said, I'm on a hunger strike for this, my, my view would be, yeah, I guess you're going to lose some weight, huh? I mean, it makes no – I don't see why people find that a dramatic thing, that I'm going to starve myself. You know, what don't tell you about? Why don't you hold your breath and, you know, until you turn blue? <laughs> turn blue, yeah. I know. It's the same thing. You know, I mean, I don't – I don't. you know, that's not going to – if I was in charge of making the decision, that one's off in my heart. Mm-hmm. You know, and uh, so I don't know if that's real, but uh, but it's a sad case. I uh, I had some friends in New York, used to be uh, do ministry in New York, and they were very very saddened by by this decision. They're just like you know, this just uh, kills a lot of ministry mm-hmm. and opportunity. Yeah, that's yeah, uh, really too bad. And you know, <laughs> if you own a, a hall, though, 
um, you know, if you have a bar or a bowling alley or, or some other kind of hall that you uh, rent out, boy, <laughs> raise your prices. <laughs> You'll be in demand. That's right. <laughs> You'll be in demand, that's for sure. Another sad one down in Virginia, but I was afraid that the court had to make this decision this way. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, I, I really – I agree the court made the right decision, but it's this decision I've, I I have a problem with the theology, the, 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 the view behind the decision. Um, anyway, so down in Virginia, um, there have been several churches um, in the Episcopal Church who have looked and said, we are tired of the direction – the liberals in the Episcopal Church. We disagree with the viewpoints that are being uh, – uh, women clergy – uh, gay clergy, the, the liberalism that is rampant, and they have broken away, and they have formed the congregations of Anglicans in North America, Convocation. Cana, Convocation. Um, and uh, I think there's, a, I think that's the one, Convocation of Anglicans in North America. I think there might be another group too, Anglican group. But anyway, so about seven churches in Virginia have left, and they said bye bye, we're done. And um, <clears throat> they claimed the uh, parish property under Virginia law. And um, this uh, federal uh, uh, Fairfax County, Virginia court, and so this goes all the way down. I mean, this is just a simple a local court. It could go, this is going to be appealed and go higher. But uh, has argued that no, the diocese and the Episcopal Church own these buildings. And while the congregations could lead the Episcopal Church, they could not take the building with them. And that is the, um, uh, uh, you know, the, the position of the Episcopal Church. It always has been that even though the diocese does not put a dime into the building, it's only held in trust on behalf of the diocese. Therefore. And it's their property. Therefore, you can you're free, you're free to leave, but you can't take the building with you. Right, and their right to do that is because the church has agreed to that when they um, when they found the church. Mm-hmm. So, you know, since you, in essence, signed a contract with the diocese that um, that that's the way it's going to be. You know, you agreed to it. It's in writing. It's kind of a done deal. Right. Although some of them argue that um, – well, they, they made two arguments. Number one is that the, the, the Episcopal Church is no longer really Episcopalian. Um, uh, the, and the second one is some of these churches um, preceded the, the Episcopal Church. Therefore, they said that we don't see any reason why we should have to give it something that's, that was there beforehand. Now, it's interesting, by the way, that a um, – I was reading uh, a, 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 a blog on this, and it was one area, and I can't remember, it wasn't Virginia, it was, I think, North Carolina, where one of the dioceses there has given the property to each local congregation. Hmm. So if you want to leave, you can take the building with you. We're not going to stand in your way. Uh, but in Virginia, they're not going to do that. They're going to fight them. It makes sense for the... Um for the diocese or, you know, district or whatever you call it, um, in your, in, I'm talking in church denominations in general, um, that if a church really wants to leave, to let them take the building. Cause like, especially right now, I mean, the market being what it is, what are you going to do with the building? It's going to be a money pit. <laughs> you know, most churches are in various degrees of disrepair for one. <laughs> we've been doing a lot of work on ours it's it's actually pretty good now but um you know th- there's it, there's a lot of upkeep costs to these things and mm-hmm. who's going to buy it so i mean un- unless it's in a, a a place that you could have it torn down and sold for someone to build either a housing development or a strip mall you know there's what are you going to do with it yeah. and you know so, oh well well, they, they, I, well, they they can turn around and sell it. They could even sell it to the back to the congregation that that left. But Oof. now you have to pay a couple hundred thousand or a couple million to get the property. Well, what it does you is you can't it, just take it, right? It, it's it's it, you're you're it's basically you're 
blackmailing them into staying with the um the denomination. Yes. Which really doesn't make any sense because then you've got a whole bunch of malcontents that are just going to cause problems for you that you're really better off just if, if they don't hold to the beliefs of, of the larger body, then it makes sense for them to leave, you know, let them go. This is one of the, the things that has plagued the Missouri Synod to some degree. Uh, it's not exactly the same, but, um, at the, the walkout that the big conflict that we had back in the early seventies, um, where we had a number of, of pastors, professors and whatnot, um, who left, um, you can Google Seminex if you're not familiar with it. Um, and, um, uh, we had a number of pastors that stayed, even though they did not hold to the teachings of the Lutheran church, Missouri Synod. Um, but they stayed so that they wouldn't lose their pension. And some of them are still around today. And, um, you know, some of them changed their minds and, and came back and, and they hold to our teachings and, and teach our teachings. Um, but some of them have, have kind of stuck around and been obnoxious and, but have been allowed to collect their pensions that way. And, um, you know, it, it would have been nice if we could find a way to say, all right, um, go and we'll make sure that you're taken care of. But, um, Go away so you stop causing problems. Well, I agree that it uh, it, it is a uh, um, but there's a there's a there's a huge difference. I mean, um, because a lot of them chose to stay. They could have left. I mean, there a lot of them tried to take their churches to leave, and the churches refused. Well, the church is going to refuse. I don't have a job, so I'm staying. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that's one thing. Um. But this is a you know something completely different where it said you're free to go, just drop your keys off to the church. By the way, which we haven't put any money into, we haven't done anything with. You know, right? Uh, uh, it, you know, I mean, it, I have a real problem with this. Um, and I, one of the things I like about our church body is that the Constitution of the Synod says specifically that the Synod has no interest in the church's property. In other words, you know, we, you know, that we have no, that it, the church, the property belongs to the congregation and we have no say over anything about it. And it gives the church autonomy. Right. It gives the church the congregation. Yes. It gives a lot of autonomy. The church, the congregation can do what it wants to do. And that's exactly the way it should be. Um, you know, they don't need, you know, the synod needs the church. The church doesn't need the synod. There's no place in scripture that says it has to be part of the synod. The Episcopalians would, by the way, disagree with that. They would argue that if you're not part of the communion, you're truly not a church. Because you're not properly ordained or anything. Yeah. So, um, but I would, but I just feel bad for those churches. I really do. Don't think it's a good thing. Yeah. But yeah, I, I do agree that the the courts did what they had to do. Yeah. You know, things written the way they are, you, you can't get mad at the court. You know, they may not have been, you know, there may have been people involved in that that were not happy about having to make that decision, but it's sort of like a judge that has to uphold an unjust law. You know, right. your job is not to um, determine the validity of the law. Your job is to uphold the law. So, yep. I'll let you do the next story here. You can go to England. Go to England. All right. Um. Yeah, this is one that really disturbs me. Um, we have, this is in um, East Midlands city of Derby in England. Uh, they were, they're Muslim men, and they are distributing leaflets uh, entitled The Death Penalty, and it contends that gay sex is a sin that leads its practitioners directly to hell. It also calls for homosexuals to be given the death penalty and features on its front side a picture of a mannequin hanging from a noose. All right? And so this has been determined a, a hate crime because it is illegal to stir up hatred on the grounds of sexual orientation. And um, <clears throat> so because it is offensive and nasty, this is determined to be a crime. All right? 
Note here, while they are calling for um, the death penalty, they are not inciting violence. And I think that this is an important distinction that needs to be made. Right? They are not saying, go kill the gays. They are saying, we believe that the um, that they should receive the death penalty. It's a big difference, huge difference, All right, legally. I mean, it may feel the same way, but they're not telling people to form posses and um, <clears throat> and go out and use mob rule again or, you know, to assassinate people or, or something like that. Um, and so really, this is this is a thought crime um, and a freedom of speech sort of thing. And the, and the article sort of makes the point of, um, can you have, um, you know, it says, unfortunately, British politicians all too frequently promise they believe in freedom of speech, but, and in recent years, temptation to act has proven too much for many parliamentarians to resist. And they cite the 1986 public order act that prohibits Britons from causing anyone alarm or distress. All right. Now think about this and think about what a pastor's job is. All right. Uh, a person is guilty of an offense if, with intent to cause a person harassment, alarm, or distress, he uses threatening or a uses threatening, abusive, or insulting words or behavior, or disorderly behavior, or b displays any writing, sign, or other visible representation which is threatening, abusive, or insulting, thereby causing that or another person harassment, alarm, or distress. Well, guess what? I based on my sermon this morning, I would be arrested for this. All right. Because I called my congregation sinners, right? Which could be considered insulting. And it could cause distress. And it could cause distress. And and in fact, um I, I suggested that uh as sinners, not only um are we sinners, but that really um because of the love of Christ and and because he allowed himself to be harassed and distressed that we should be alarmed um, about the people in our community that don't know his love and um, and and that that the fact that that there are those people in our lives that don't know that that should be distressing to us and uh, so I, I very deliberately caused alarm and distress to the people in my congregation today by insulting them, calling them sinners. So, yeah, I mean, that's this is a the most ridiculously worded law. Um, so it's, it's you know, is it freedom of speech or isn't it? You know, it's, it says, uh, you know, either it's like being pregnant. Either you are or you aren't. No one can say that a person's comment or cartoon or article or leaflet was too offensive to be covered by free speech protections, then one can say someone is too guilty to stand trial. Freedom of speech means just that, regardless of whom it offends. Right? We've often said on this show, you do not have the right to not be offended. Right. But in England, you do. Yep. I, I You know, we always have to have the worry that, you know, speech is free, but... It was interesting, by the way, that a lot of people are beginning to get worried about this. Uh, Richard, uh, Richard Atkinson, best known as Mr. Bean, uh, uh, and uh, Stephen Fry, um, who... Uh, Rowan Atkinson. Uh, yeah, I said Rowan Atkinson. Stephen, Stephen Fry, who is best known for to me for uh, narrating the Harry Potter tapes in uh, England, but he's acted in several other movies and things, too. He's gay. Uh, writer Ian McCowan. Uh, you know, they said, you know, uh, this is going to lead to a culture of censor censorship, a questioning negative and leaden attitude. Uh, it cripples free expression and leaves people looking over their shoulders. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you know, I mean, some people have to understand that some people think what you're saying. I, I, I mean, <laughs> to me. Tolerance is that I have allowed the other person the freedom to be wrong, as long as they do not personally threaten me. Mm -hmm. And uh, okay, yes, this is me considered offensive. They have the right to be wrong. I'm going to give them that right. Mm -hmm. And you know what? I'm, you know, a lot of people 
uh, and especially someplace like England, would look at what the Muslims are saying and say, oh, that's just horrible. And if you just let them go out there and, and be – talk like idiots, most you know, then people will sit there and just say, you know, just get away from me. I don't want to hear what you have to say. Mm-hmm. Oh, well, so. you know, and that's the goofy thing. It's like there's nothing insidious here, right? These guys are like really being openly offensive, all right? I mean, you know, I find what they're saying offensive, and I think it's it's pretty public knowledge of, of what we believe about homosexuality. <laughs> they're sinners, just like the rest of us, but that, you know, that that is not God's intent for human beings, right? And, um, but... So, but I, I completely object to their way of, of going about it and, um, you know, calling for the death penalty and, and things like that. No, that, that's, that's insane. Right. But, um, the, you know, so, you know, I find what they're doing offensive. But at the same time, they have the right to, to say what they're saying, wrong though they be. Uh, that is true. Uh, well, let's go back to a good decision. Uh, 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 let's go to Czechoslovakia. And this, I think, is a, it was a good decision here. I was pleased by this one. A uh, long time back ago, um, of course, uh, in the days of uh, communism, uh, the uh, communists stole not all stole churches, stole churches and properties from congregations. Just all kinds of stuff. And um, the 22 years ago, they gave the churches back, the, the church buildings back to the churches. They said, you know, uh, you know, the, the property that had been confiscated, we're giving back. Um, however, uh, and uh, uh, churches were then paid for by the state. Um, however, in 1989, I'm not sure where this has got cut off, but uh, anyway, let me just recap. 1948, the uh, communists comes into power. They confiscated all the property owned by churches, persecuted many priests. Churches were only allowed to function under state control, and the priest salaries were paid by the state. In 1989, we have the Velvet Revolution, led by Volk, Vol, Volkhev Havel. Uh, at that time, churches, some churches and monasteries were returned back to local churches. But farms, woodlands, other buildings, retreat centers, things like that were not. And so ever since then, the churches have sought to get the rest of their property back. Uh, so this week, a um, uh, uh, way of doing that was finally brought forth that looks like it's going to pass uh, a parliament. Now, their parliament has uh, a three-governing coalition, um, and earlier minority co uh, groups within that coalition had uh, rebelled and said, no, we don't want to do this, uh, because thanks to communism and its atheism, atheism there is a lot of non-Christians in Czechoslovakia this, this today. Uh, but they did come up with a plan that they think is going to work. Uh, first off, they're going to... Uh, uh, um, Get 56% of um, their former property now held by the state. Um, so they're going to get that money right away. Um, then they're going to get uh, some more money, which will be paid out over the next 30 years. At the same time, they're going to gradually stop covering the expenses of the clergy. Um, which I think it makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, clergy should never be employees of the government. Right. Just, that's bad. Well, the government you, can tell you what you to know, say. When the government takes, yeah, when the government takes it over, I mean, that's what they're going to do. Um, it's interesting that uh, uh, it says at one point, yeah, the uh, uh, the country of Czechoslovakia is considered one of the most atheist in Europe. Only 40%, uh, 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 70 percent of the Czechs were against uh, religious restitution, and only 40 percent consider churches to be at all useful. 
It's sad. You make me sad. So be it. Come, Patsy. So, oh, and, and just a clarification, we're talking about the Czech Republic here since um, Czechoslovakia no longer exists, per se. Um, not sure what's going on in Slovakia. It's a dis- it's an important distinction around here. I've got a lot of Slovak uh, people either in my congregation or you know in the community. So I live in the land of pierogies. Ah, okay. <laughs> so I, you know, this is one of the very sad things about communism, and you know that they came in and tried to wipe out the churches, didn't wipe out the churches, but did have a major influence. And I, I think this is something that, you know, people look at, at the religious persecution that happened under communism, and they don't really think about the fact of that, to some degree, it was effective, right? Churches, in a sense, thrived in that um, if you were a member of a church, it, it sort of, um, well, to use an expression, separated the men from the boys, all right? You know, the you 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 didn't have any nominal members of of your congregation, all right? Um, but it was so. It, I mean, it, it really it sent a very powerful message when you have the testimony of these people that are willing to uh, put their lives on the line and 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 suffer all kinds of torture and all kinds of nasty stuff that they endured. Um, but at the same time, because the churches did not have the ability to um, to freely share the gospel in the community, um, they people didn't hear it, and they sort of got on with life without it, and really didn't see a need for it because any sort of spiritual talk was uh, just it was just removed from uh, the conversations of the of the nation. And, um, and so, you know, they don't see a need for it. Now, some might argue that, um, well, that just shows that there really is no need once you sort of take that away. Um, but just the very fact that they see seizing people's property, um, and not giving it back is okay. That shows what happens when you remove uh, the concept of absolute right and wrong. So I, I think that's yeah. a, that, I mean, wow, how, how clear is it how much they need the church to speak out on, you know, on, on ethics, on, um, you know, on, on what is right and wrong and, and how to treat people. That you can't just go around seizing people's property and, and expect that you shouldn't have to pay it back. Ah, oh boy, that monkey is going to pay. So, uh, it's you know it's 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 good that they're giving doing something, but uh, I think the really sad thing here is that people are going to be upset about the fact that pe- they're giving people back what is rightfully theirs. All right, never should been taken from them in the first place. Right, and they're not even getting it all back. They're getting some of it back, and some of it, it's going to take them 30 years to get it back. Wow. That, I mean, <laughs> you know, you, you look at, at what we did, what the United States did to the, um, like to the Japanese um, during World War II, the American Japanese, um, the relocation and all that kind of stuff, and, which was horrible. But, you know, like we said, sorry, and, you know, like, we, we, what can we do to to fix that? And, you know, and you know, we even helped rebuild the nation of Japan. Um, <clears throat> but uh, not, and I, I'm not justifying what America did, but I'm saying that you know these uh, what what's going on in in Czech Republic. It's like, okay, well, that's a good first step, but you guys got a long ways to go. And, uh, you know, maybe you need a few clergy around to actually give some insight into what's the proper way to handle this stuff. Or a dog. (laughs) 
My goodness, I had two dogs. They both decided to go bizarre. <laughs> so, yeah, that, uh, that's uh, that's sad. It is. It's very frustrating. Anyway, so um, um, well, I guess that's going to end things for this week. Um, you know, what can I tell you? Keep cheering for New England since the Packers are gone, and um, yeah, we'll see how we do in the future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will be cheering against New England, whoever they. There's probably exceptions to that. I, I, I have to look again at, at who's available now. Cause San Francisco and the Giants in the NFC and the Baltimore Ravens against New England next week. Yeah, no one to root for. So, so you know, uh, and of course the Ravens are, you know, what used to be the Browns. Yeah. So. I don't know. Well, you know, when you live in a place like Cleveland that doesn't have a professional football team, you know. <laughs> You had one. It just moved to yeah. Baltimore. <laughs> and then we got the, you know, sort of the, the Jason Todd of <laughs> football teams. It's just not the same as the original. That's no, not, it's not. So anyway, my friend, we'll talk to you all later. Have a good night. God bless. All right. Good night, everybody. God bless.